My name's Bruce and I'm from Perth. I've been performing stand-up comedy in Scotland for oof, 16 years. And I remember once during a gig, somebody actually laughed. I'll never forget it, because it was in Dundee at the time. And it wasn't at the end of the joke, but in the middle. And they didn't just laugh, they heckled me to ridicule me for using the word house instead of house. What was I thinking? It wasn't even Burns Night. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story of the Scots language. There will be subtitles. Now, here's a picture of me and my sister when we were bairns. When we were a wee bit older than this, we got sent to elocution lessons. Now, I visited my sister on Christmas Day this year and took her some clouty dumpling. And as we were sitting blethering, something smacked me right across the napper. Didn't get me wrong, she didn't smack me with a clouty dumpling, no. It was just that we I mind how my auntie used to make that and, you know, I'll give you a bit of context for the story. Anyway, I hadn't seen her since the whole Covid thing and we were bumping our gums and tucking it in some scran and I suddenly realised that it's when I'm with hers when I'm most likely to speak natural. I mean, we've kenned each other for near 60 years and nobody's got any airs and graces to put on. If you need to fart, you need to fart. All I'm saying is that after the cash that she put in our execution lessons in the graveyard, they call your auntie Nora the Burla. Now, normally I try to take you to relevant places, but since <coughs> I've got the COVID, I'm locked in my little office in my house for a wee while. So, no sweeping highland vistas. When I make these videos, I don't speak as I would in that relaxed environment with my sister. I speak a far more standard form of English, albeit with a Scottish accent. But even then, one transatlantic critic in the comment section said, This is completely unwatchable. Why doesn't this guy just learn to speak English? I can understand your frustration, sir. You've clicked on a channel to hear a Scotsman talking about Scotland and the sneaky sods tricked you by using a Scottish accent. It's worse than that, mate. I spell colour where you can stick it right up your ring piece. Y'all. So, I thought I'd tell you how it all came to this. There's a very good book about the Scots language by Billy Kay called The Mother Tongue, and I'll leave a link in the description below. Better still, for the people that support the channel as Patreon members, I'm meeting up with Billy on the 24th of January the eve of Burns Night, to put your questions to him. So, if you're not a Patreon member, then you can become one by clicking the white tab up there. Send in any questions about Scots language or culture or anything else for that matter, and I'll put them to Billy in our conversation. But here's the gist. If you've been watching this channel, then you'll know that I made a series of videos about who made the Scottish people, including the Picts, the Scots, the Britons, the Angles and the Vikings are coming soon. Each of these groups brought languages with them. But from the 9th to the 11th centuries, as the country that we call Scotland was consolidating, the Gaelic of the Scots became dominant. I mean, there were bits around the edges where other languages continued and some folk would be multilingual, but Gaelic was the language of court, nobility and influence. In the bit that had been Northumbria, they still spoke a bit of that Germanic language of the Angles. In fact, I'm told that as late as World War I, the Germans could actually understand prisoners of war who spoke in broad Scots. The high point of Gaelic was the time of Macbeth, and then Malcolm Canmore came out of exile to overthrow Macbeth with an Anglo-Saxon army. He married a Saxon princess, Margaret, who populated monasteries and other positions with people from the south. So you can see how this Germanic language moved from the fringes to gain influence. Malcolm and Margaret's son David uh, had his power base in the south of Scotland, but he brought Norman and Flemish knights to secure or suppressed, depending on your point of view, the areas further north. And these Flemish incomers, and of course Anglo-Saxons and their Norman retinues, became the administrators, and this Germanic language took further hold. The language that they spoke wasn't called Scots, but English, the language of the Angles. So English became the language of large swathes of people both north and south of the border. 
Some still spoke Norman French, Gallic or Norse tongues, but whilst the nobility on either side at Bannockburn would have understood each other perfectly in Norman French, large parts of the foot soldiers would have slaughtered each other in a mutually understood Germanic language. Then, as the short-lived Bruce dynasty gave way to the Stuarts, there was a change. That change between the 1400 and 1700-ish largely took place in the south of England. It's called the Great Vowel Shift, and it's basically how the English cheat at Scrabble. This Great Vowel Shift meant that the south of England moved away from the original sounds of Germanic English. Now, I've seen different explanations given for the reason. Was it migration? Was it words and sounds borrowed under French military, political or cultural influence? Whatever the reason, people in the south of England changed the way that they spoke. Now, think about that thing in a field with the udders that gives you milk. Unless you're one of those lactose intolerant soft southern pussies. It's a joke. And given that cats are lactose intolerant anyway, the pussies come from every direction of the compass. The point is that nowadays the English would call that other thing a cow. In fact, more properly even a cow. The Dutch would say coo. The Danish would say coo. The Germans say coo. And of course the Scots say coo. So as the southern English moved away, what was retained in lowland Scotland became known as Scots. Scots was the language of the Stuarts. Now, some people start banging on in the comment section about Jacobites. I'm talking about the S-T-E-W-A-R-T-S. -E when Mary Queen of Scots went to France, the French difficulties with sound and spelling meant that they changed the spelling to S-T-U-A-R-T. -E Although it wasn't just a turning point for the Stuart name, but the Scots language. Incidentally, whilst we're thinking about that turning point, I'd love it if you'd put a favourite Scots word in the comment section. I'll start with Burach. You see, throughout the reign of James I, 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th, Scots was our nation's language of the royal court, the language of the legal court, the language of literature and high culture, and the language of the common people, at least in lowland Scotland. Although obviously the high Scots of the royal court would vary from the language of the peasantry. Then came the Reformation and the country was divided into pro-English Protestants and pro-French Catholics. In the comment section of one video somebody asked me why it was that John Knox promoted the English language Geneva Bible rather than commission a Scots language Bible. Mainly for simplicity. You see, the English may have lost their way and sounded differently, but there was enough similarity in writing that literate people both sides of the border could look at the same Bible and understand its meaning. Think Norwegians, Danes and Swedes. Although Knox had spent quite a while in England, and he was a bit of an Anglophile. Apparently, he wrote in an English style. So some Catholic Scots would rip the pan out of Protestant Scots for no being Scottish enough. The post-Reformation King of Scots was of course James VI and he spoke in and wrote several books in Scots. But things were about to change. When he also became King of England, some of his writings were reprinted in the English style. Now, James's granddad, James V, and his father, James IV, had had court mackers, poets and literary men writing in Scots. Of course, when James arrived in England, he was immediately courted by a poet and playwright who even wrote a play especially for James in that mongrel English tongue. His name was William Shakespeare, and that play was Macbeth. Not only did court patronage for Scots mackers disappear, not only did the court start adopting that errant southern dialect, but it became the language of a new Bible authorised by King James himself. And a hundred years later, an even bigger disaster was the union between Scotland and England. Now, as soon as I use those words, there'll be raj bams from both sides of the debate chittering in the comment section. Forget your opinions about the rights and wrongs or goods or ills of modern politics. That event was a disaster for our national language. 
The toffs had moved from Scots to English. Now the middle class business and academic sphere were doing the same. In that incredible period of the Scottish Enlightenment, when there was an explosion of intellectual thought in Scotland that changed the world, Voltaire said, it's to Scotland that we look for our ideas of civilization. But the Scotsmen who were providing those world-changing ideas were taking elocution lessons to try to rid themselves of their own native language. Get this, David Hume one of the world's greatest philosophers could write a manuscript, but before he published it, he would send it to a linen draper in Bristol and a cobbler in Norwich to get them to make sure that his groundbreaking philosophical thought had any Scotticisms taken out. The English language wasn't superior. He could express his high-flown ideas in Scots. It was just that we'd reached the younger and the most erps of doublespeak when the people who moved away from the origins of the language in their ignorance and arrogance proclaimed that the men of genius reimagining the modern world spoke a barbarous tongue. Edinburgh Academy became the first of the private schools in Edinburgh to ban Scots. In Edinburgh! This produced students who spoke the standard English that, even in posh Scots to this day, is still recognisable but practically indistinguishable from English. Of course, once you get the aristocratic class to give up the language, then you get the middle classes to follow, there's no use for the language's high literature, and you just tell the commoners that they can't speak properly. They never had a language. They're just speaking English badly. It's in that period that Robert Burns comes along and upset the apple cart, showing that Scots was a language of beauty, satire, comedy and expression. And because he could write in English, it was a valid language of choice. And that's why when I was a child and being sent to elocution lessons by my granny and scolded at school because Scots is for the stupid, you'll never get a proper job, speak proper English, that one week a year on Burns' birthday, we had to compete to see who could speak Scots the best. What a tapsal toury world that was. To illustrate just how deep the programming is, let me give you an example from this very week. Obdin Mahu's come down with Rona. Everyone in my house was diagnosed with COVID. Now, the track and trace woman phoned and spoke to my wife to find out where the dirty hussy had been spreading the disease. And then my wife passed me the phone for my interview, and the woman on the other end was clearly from the northeast. Aberdeen, Banff, Buchan, up that way. She was speaking standard English but with a northeast accent. I was speaking standard English in my Perthshire accent, which is obviously better. After a few minutes of formalities and questions, I thought that I'd have a bit of fun and I started throwing in curveballs by using Scots words. Of course, it weren't curveballs at all. She understood exactly what I was saying. In fact, she started using Scots words as well. Before you knew it, we were both using Scots words. The conversation became more relaxed, less formal. We exchanged jokes. It was natural. Now, here's the thing. My wife is from the northeast, but when she'd been on the phone, I had no idea that she was speaking to somebody else from that area because I only heard standard English. They weren't adapting so that they could understand each other, but in spite of being brought up in the same area, they both knew the rules that had been programmed into them all those years ago at school. Speak proper English. I've got a better rule. If you're Scottish, speak what Scots you have. It's the language of royalty, literature and our nation. The only reason that Scots don't realise that is because of the deliberate process of cultural colonisation. Now, before political raj bams lose the heat completely, obviously, if there's confusion, you change to a language that both will understand. I've been in a dormitory in Sweden sharing with a Japanese guy and the only language we had in common was French. Not once did I say, Hootsman up your kilt is a bra brick moon lich nick the nicht. Because nobody in Scotland talks like that. 
But even if the woman from Track and Trace had been from Newcastle, we'd probably understand each other pretty well without changing to be understood by some tough Londoner who wasn't even there. We should never restrict Scots to Burns Night. But if you'd like a quick summary of the life of Burns in 10 minutes, then I've got a video coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, Dawkins can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.